Hey everybody, welcome to another IAIB Spotlight for the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Uh, this is also broadcasting live on gfqlive.tv. Uh, if you miss any portion, portion of this show, you could go check it out at ibroadcastnetwork.com. Or, of course, at gfknetwork.com also. Uh, this week, we have a very special guest. We have Michael Manna from t4show.com uh, on the show. We're going to be discussing everything from internet broadcasting, how we got into it. Uh, also, uh, he's doing something very interesting with a workout system. Uh, and we're going to talk about how he records that. I've always been fascinated by uh, how some of those things are shot. Because you would think it, it, would, it requires so much video and audio to kind of get everything going. So we're going to go through that as well. But I want to introduce my guest. Hey, Michael, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Andrew? Great, great. Uh, I'm really excited for you to be here. And I know uh, I have a lot of questions for you. And I know a lot of the viewers have questions for you. Uh, so I want to go right into this. Uh, your transition to, to broadcasting is a very interesting story because you come from a totally different background. Uh, was when did you start getting involved in this? Because you do a podcast with T4 Show, uh, and and you're very much into technology. When did you take this dive into internet broadcasting or podcasting? Well, I've always I've always been such a fan of technology. I've always had a passion for technology, and I know you're referring to the to the wrestling that I've done for the past twenty plus years, uh, and trying to see how that exactly fits in with the other thing, which it doesn't. But I, the, there's different things that I have different passions for, I, you know, in no particular order, fitness, technology, wrestling. And, and that's what we're going to cover uh, in the show. I just, uh, especially with WWE being there for nine years, uh, you don't have exactly the creative outlet. And we've all had jobs like that where we can't really mm -hmm. express ourselves. Nobody can hear our voice or our written word, or we, we can't build something on our own. And I think that's the, the nature of, of human beings, hopefully, is to really try to leave a legacy and try to build something on your own from the ground up at some point in your life. And I've always wanted to do that with a technology show uh, because just like wrestling, just like fitness, uh, technology is always changing. Every day there's something new coming out. It's almost, I mean, it's almost to a fault because we can't keep up with we it. We can, yeah. Casters. But that's the beautiful thing. You'll never get bored with technology. And that's why I thought doing a technology show and, and trying to build it as a brand would be such a great uh, endeavor to do. And, and you know, it, it's had its up and downs, which we're going to discuss also yeah. on this show. Uh, but every day that I get up, I first thing I do is grab my iPhone. First thing I do is grab my iPad. I go to the gym. I use technology from the time I wake up till the time I go to bed. So uh, it's ingrained and it's a, it's a natural, it's more of a natural crossover than people might realize watching me wrestle for the past two plus yeah and, and that's fascinating to many people because you would imagine because you're in front of a camera and you you have the you know you have the ability to be on a microphone and you have an audience uh it's still not your voice in many situations it it used to be an extension of what i wanted to be or make pretty you know we're making pretend we're other people sometimes or we turn the volume way up to a hundred uh but yeah there's certain times especially over the past uh, you know, since about, I don't know, 2003, 2004, where I really didn't have a voice in wrestling. I was really just kind of scripted and kind of told what to do and uh, just kind of cashed my check. I mean, which we all do at our jobs, sure. just eat, eat crap. Uh, but, you know, with the T4 show, that's that's what really was the springboard. Me saying, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to sit back and say, well, I can't do it. I know I can do this. I know I can do it on my own. I'm going to be Michael Mann and I'm not going to be Stevie Richards. If it succeeds or fails... It's only going to be could be because of my efforts and how much I put into it and how hard I tried to make it successful, not using wrestling or my television persona or anything as a crutch. And, I'm sure many know, people have asked you that as well, right? Uh, yeah. You went, why did you pick your name? But I, I could, I, I see why you would do that because you wanted to, you want to express yourself, not the character. Yeah, and you know, you bring a whole uh, a whole sort of negative vibe or a distraction. Uh, you know, let the wrestling fans uh, think whatever they want. They can come in. I'm sure there's some in the room right now. But what I wanted, my goal from the very beginning, I was smart enough to know, hey, let the companies that I'm going to hopefully build relationships with see that, oh, this guy does a one-week update video, a three-week or a month or a three-month or six or a one year. He really follows the product, and he really is uh, – returning our investment on giving him this expensive tech product or this this service he really is using it and telling the consumer the pros and cons of it 
rather than say, hey, I'm a, I'm a wrestler on TV, and then they start asking a million different questions. And it goes a completely different direction than I'm trying to, yeah. to, to build this particular brand relationship with these companies. Do you feel that it almost becomes a distraction in a way for you because you're trying to you're 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 trying to achieve one goal but there's also this whole different thing that comes along with it i i take that any anybody that's in entertainment and i'm sure you've dealt with a lot of people at the big brother show and the other stuff that i've seen you post up on your social media uh hub you, you, they deal with it it's yeah. part of it you know the 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 I, I'm pretty well trained at answering questions and, and dealing with the public and dealing with people that interview me. Uh, but yeah, that's not a big deal. If people go, I can bring it around and bring it back to point if I need to, but yeah. just that effort after the first 10, 20, 100 times trying to, this is more of a business type thing. It's not in interacting with our, our chat room and answering questions to fans. This is actually trying to get, it's like you go into hover and they keep asking you about the what those two girls are like on that magazine cover. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, well, we're supposed to be doing business here. Come on. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, that's probably happened a couple of times too to me. Um, so you decided to do T4 show. What what was the process like? I'm really always curious about how people, uh, how people put it together. You know, how do you, it goes from a concept that you have on, on pen and paper to the actual thing. What was the process like for you, and how did you make that transition? I uh, had pitched T4 show to WWE.com back uh, in 2006, and I had a very professional presentation put together for the head of digital media and all this stuff, and I really wanted to did I tried being the C.B. Richards character and tried to say, all right, well, let me try to get this as a, as a springboard or something to, to do some stuff with, and they completely treated it like a joke, so that made me go back to the drawing board, like you said, go to pen and paper, and just kind of like more by trial and error, because here's the way I think it breaks down, especially when you're doing a podcast, you have, you know, a budget and people that are smart will say, okay, I'm going to start off with a Logitech $29 desktop mic, the USB one. I may go as high as right now, because back then when we started, Andrew, there weren't, there weren't the, you know, the multiple really good quality USB mics where you can monitor your audio like I am right now, like you are. Sure, yeah. It was like a Samson CO1U, I think, is the best one you could find back then. And there was no monitoring, especially for someone with the vocal problems I have. I need to monitor uh, my levels and my voice. So you want to go start off cheap, which I tried to do with the uh, Samson mic. In the first 10 to 50 episodes, I was like trying to find myself and trying to figure out. And believe me, if you're going to do a podcast, just count on the first 10, 20, up to 50 episodes being awful. Absolutely. That's the, it's the learning process. That's I tell people what, that all the time. I mean, even even now, I'll I'll go back and I'll listen to something from a year ago, and I've been you know I've been doing this since two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and and I listen back. I'm like, wow, this is awful. Yeah. So I mean, it's going to evolve almost every every like twenty weeks. You're you're kind of evolving and you're finding your place. But you're absolutely right. The first year, throw it out the window because it's just it's training. Yeah, and it's great. It, it, you look back on it. I look back on it uh, very positively, and I think to myself, the the best decision that I made, and I did it like seven or eight episodes in, was get somebody to co-host the show with me. Was Don't that a difficult? Was that difficult for you to find someone that kind of fits with you in, in the type of show you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I went from uh, having my buddy Robbie, who I was friends with for many years, Rob Zeta, and we still had that chemistry. You could still do a show together if we wanted to. It's just, you know the deal, Andrew. Yeah. People go, people have things that happen in their real life. This isn't a full-time job for a lot of people. It's more of a hobby. Uh, you know, I went from there. I went to uh, do the T4 show with him and another uh, girl named Yaling. Uh, it's taken on all these different uh, incarnations leading up to today with Colm, who we definitely have a lot of chemistry. He, he brings a lot of energy to the show. He's a, a very, very energetic person, has a, has a boisterous personality, and uh, I'm there to calm him down. And that's like, <laughs> that's our kid. No, no, he's a lot of fun. We had him on, uh, on Monday on the Big Brother show that we do, Big Brother Rewind, and he was great. I mean, articulate, great guy, and he's great on camera. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he really is the energy of the show. I, I, I kind of talk and I try to lead. I don't know if I'm so much, we try to play host back and forth. And this is a difficult thing too. It's it's easy to be a guest on your show. It's hard to lead a show in the direction you want. And, and more times than not, Colm and I just go by luck and hit record and just kind of, kind of mess around with it and may, make fun of the fact that we're not, we're not really experts at this. So 
Uh, that's another thing. If you're going to host a show, you really have to know that it's a it's a very hard thing to interview somebody, especially over audio where you can't see their voice and you can't read them and you can't see how they're you know reacting to things. It's a, oh, it's it very can, difficult. No, it's a very difficult thing. And I know you guys did audio only at one point and you went and you did the video and then you went back to audio. Uh, how was that transition for you and, and why did you make the switch? That's because uh, the, the personal things happened in my life where I was moving around and things were happening. You can see behind me, I'm, I'm going to probably end up in a, in a, you know, a better, a better spot where I can have a studio, uh, you know, but in life we go through our transition periods and in the past two, three years, I've been going through one of my own and that's kind of where we gave up the video. It wasn't because, oh, the video is a pain in the ass. I hate using Wirecast, which sometimes we do. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Wirecast. Uh, but it was more so because okay, I'm, I'm kind of in this hotel room for three weeks and I don't have any good internet, but I know we can squeeze some audio out of this. And that was kind of the, that was definitely the only reason why we didn't do video. And then of course, at times that it just seemed like one thing after the other, Colm had a, had a son, JMAV and uh, his schedule picked up, mine did and didn't sync up. And it, it was nothing else, but just now uh, logistics. And we're sure. trying to get track with that well that also has to be difficult because you find you find your groove and you get comfortable comfortable in front of the camera and you're kind of uh, you know it becomes this fluid type show and then you have to cut it and do something else you know that also could affect the way you broadcast yes absolutely absolutely and let's not forget we're dealing with technology so you can have everything set up properly 99 times and then at 100th time everything just goes to crap yeah, sure. Uh, T4show.com is a website, guys. Uh, definitely check it out because I've I actually I caught that Saturday show you guys did. Yeah, uh, we saw your chat room. I, I came in for that. I hung out for that, and you guys do a great job, and it's and it's extremely entertaining. Now, the content you guys do technology and gaming. Were you always into gaming? Did it, did it start? Did the technology stuff start after uh, you know the wrestling? How did it work for you? No, I dropped a lot of quarters in the uh, local grocery store at Spy Hunter. I used to <laughs> do all sorts of, yeah, video games was my passion before computers because when I was, oh, I might be aging myself right here, but when I was in high school and in college, there was no computers. Computers were just coming into the schools, uh, but video games were around. We had, Nintendo, you know, Atari, uh, Atari 2600, 5200, 7800, I think, ColecoVision. Uh, that, that was really my main passion growing up was playing video games. Um, I remember a lot of summers playing NHL 94 uh, for 16 hours straight. Sure, yeah. When I was wrestling in ECW, I would just play right up until I had to leave for the ECW arena and then come back. I'd have the game paused, by the way. I'd wrestle, come back, and we'd pick the game up when I, when I got wow, home. Wow, that's actually year. really funny. Yeah, I, that's the last time. NHL 94, a little fun fact, it was the last time there was actually blood in the game. Remember you used to skate over the guy and, or you hit the guy and the blood was Yeah, because they took it out for 95. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah you're absolutely right uh so you were always into gaming uh were you into broadcasting were you a fan of radio i was a, i was a fan of radio yeah as you become older and once again i'm gonna age myself uh <laughs> as you become older you you be you become more of a fan of talk radio i don't know how or when that happened but i love listening to talk radio and now it's more so so i can say okay that guy's using a shore sm7b that 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 woman's using an RE20, I, you know, and these are these are microphones, and we'll get to it later, I'm sure, that have tempted me to go away from the one I'm using now because those are industry, industry standards, especially the RE20. Uh, but now it's more so I want to know the, the the background. I want to know how, what kind of processing, what kind of uh, compression, what are they using, and the, what kind of pro tools, or are they just using Wirecast? Are they just using Skype? What What's going on with this radio station? And Philly, and you're originally from Philly, and, and that's a big radio uh, place. I mean, that's a great radio city. Oh, yeah. I still listen to sports talk from there. It just get, get, get that gets a little depressing because everybody who calls in hates the Eagles, hates the Phillies. They're yeah. stupid. I couldn't listen this week with the trades and everything. I'm yeah. sure people are just lighting it up on, uh, I think it's 610 WIP. Yeah, that's that's the one I always listen to. So you you now you start T4 show. Some of the, the uphill battles for you, you said uh, you have vocal issues. Was that difficult for you? Because now you're, you're, you're talking all the time. How is that for you considering with the vocal issues that you have? I, I get normal my like I got a migraine right now from talking for more than 15 20 minutes but that's something that I've learned to deal with and something that's just part of it I, I mean it, it's gotten me out of a lot of trouble not being able to talk a whole lot of time. <laughs> yeah I, I wish it could get me out of trouble too yeah. uh, what, uh, how did you learn uh to to set everything up and to kind of do was it trial and error what what was it 
Yeah, absolutely. Trial and error. And also the internet community. The internet community has been great. I mean, it wasn't even as uh, as big as it is right now with the, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, stuff like that. I, you know, but but people have helped me along the way. Steve uh, from the Tech Buzz, Chase, you've had him on the you had him on the show last week. Uh, Dizzy Doug, Colm helps a lot with the graphics. He's a great, you know, he's an art director, so he should know about you know creating really nice graphics. Uh, our friend SA helped with the website. I, I haven't done, I mean, I may have done 3% out of the whole 100%. Yeah. That's, I mean, I think I just talk on the microphone and everybody else does everything. It's a lot of, a lot of people willing to help and willing to, to, to bring up, uh, you know, the, the name community is not just a name when it comes to the internet. There's a lot of negativity out there, but there's also a lot of people like you and Steve and Chase and the people I mentioned before that are really good people that just want to help out. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, it's still, it's still so new and still so fresh. And I really consider like the wild west when it comes to broadcasting. Uh, there, there's so much out there and everybody's doing something a little different than the other person. So why not put that information out there and give it away? I mean, I pretty much give away every possible bit of information that I know uh, even down to context, unless I'm signed to an NDA, it doesn't really matter to me. If we could better the community and we could better the the art of internet broadcasting as a whole, why not try to do it? Because th- one thing that this industry uh, is makes it one thing that makes it different is that we really don't compete with each other. You could do the same exact show that I'm doing, and you're doing it on Wednesday, and I'm doing it on Thursday, but we're not competing because it's totally different, and our audience could listen to the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And that's, that's something, if you've noticed that, uh, you know, we've taken on a lot of different, different looks, a lot of different lives uh, with the T4 show. I do watch a lot of other people and I don't look at them and say, I don't look at the GFQ network or, or IAIB or Geek Gamer Weekly or the Tech Buzz or any of these things and say, oh man, I got to step it up and try to beat these guys. I do look at the other stuff and say, well, they covered it here. They covered it here. They get a good audience here. Let me try to go in a different direction to, to offer something more unique because I don't want to just be another tech news show. I don't want to be, a, that's why you've seen the past couple T4 shows or three or four. It's been one particular subject, mountain lion, you know, the, the couple other things that we talked about, just one subject. And now with the, you know, me bringing back the product updates and maybe even app updates once a week on a video that you can see for five, 10, 15 minutes and condense it in and give you that, you know, for the people that have ADD, yeah. give you a three minute thing on each one and maybe we'll get a good response off that or maybe not and we'll do something else. It, it's the beauty of doing it. It can be anything you want to create or recreate. So you're, you're using Wirecast for your show, right? Uh, yes. How has that been for you? How Because many of our viewers use Wirecast and, they, and I... And I love to hear how it's evolved over the last couple of years because we used VidBlaster and when we started using it, uh, it was really different compared to now. Uh, we're just starting to incorporate Wirecast as an encoder for us. So I, w- I would love to hear how it's evolved for you and the way you use it. How has that changed? What you're getting with Wirecast, I laugh because it's just like it, something new always comes up with that. And and that's fine because it's a very, it's a very involved piece of a piece of software and what you're basically getting then for people that don't know and may know what a tricaster is you're getting a tricaster for either five hundred dollars or under a thousand dollars and that's a pretty powerful piece of broadcasting software like i said and the fact that i can run wirecast and i can do it with vidblaster too uh, if i'm emulating windows but for mac alone i'm using wirecast on the retina display macbook pro and it's running like crazy. It's it's such a great portable TV studio. I could bring this. I could bring the cameras, my intensity extreme, and basically run a multicam web show from anywhere as long as I have the internet connection and stream it live. And I think that's changed the way that this business works. I think it's a lot easier now for someone like you, someone like me, anybody. I mean, we don't have a broadcasting background. Your 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 background is more entertainment, and and that helps you obviously when with your presence in front of a camera. But when it comes to technology, I think all of us are, are starting on this even field and nobody really has the advantage and we all have to piece it together. You know, unless you have, you know, a, a multi-million dollar facil- facility like Leo and Twit does. Uh, was, we're, we're on the same page. I was going to say, I, too many people try to be Leo and I wish I wish that they wouldn't. He is the, he is the, uh, the measuring stick, but let's face it, he spent $2 million on a studio. And how many other hundreds of thousands, maybe millions on the equipment. 
and he pays people and he has something. We're not, you're switching your stuff. You're looking down, you're doing all this stuff and everything. He's got people in the background, manning cameras, using the TriCasters, multiple TriCasters, has servers, has all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, it's it's a television network at this point. And, and, and God bless him because he's really, he's paving the way. You're absolutely right. And he's opened this, this, this category of internet broadcasting up for all of us. I mean, he's really paved the way and he's, but this is a guy and, and we have to remember this. He's a guy that's been on the radio for 30 years. He's a seasoned uh, anchor. He's been on television. He's a celebrity and he has an existing audience. So what he's doing, in my opinion, will never work for anybody else. And I, I don't think it should be replicated. I don't think it should be emulated. I mean, we could, we could look at him and, and say, wow, he's doing a great job at this and take aspects of it. But uh, when people sit there, you know, and they're doing Leo, uh, I, I don't think that's going to work for anybody other than Leo. Yeah. And I, well, I'm, I'm guilty too. I saw him using the PR 40 and decided to get one much. And like it's a other, great mic. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, it's funny. I, here's a, here's a, uh, an analogy and this is not meant to discourage anybody. This is just meant to, to have people enjoy it. This is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be something you put pressure on yourself. It's supposed to be a fun hobby. And if it turns into more, that's great. I was on TV for 20 years. I still, I still, I will be on TV when Lucha Libre starts airing their stuff again on MTV too. I got stuff taped for, for whatever reason. By the uh, way, uh, I, I used to watch on MSG at one in the morning here in Queens. I used to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I used to watch, I used to watch uh, ECW on, on MSG at one in the morning, 1 a.m. So uh, I'm very familiar with everything that you did for years. It would never air today. It would no. never air today in the, uh, in the Chick-fil-A overly sensitive PC world that we live in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so I, I would like to touch on that. Why, why not? What has changed and why do you think the internet is the, the, place for that type of programming could something like that survive you know so cutting edge no i don't i i mean i don't know he, the, paul had his uh it was a completely different time it was a, it, there was nothing desensitized back then now everything's been so desensitized and everybody's so overly sensitive uh to everything if you look, go back and look at the why a lot of we a lot of what we did in ecw it, it could be pretty offensive you know, not just the crucifixion angle. I mean, not just for some reason because Kurt Angle was in the audience. That's the only reason nobody would have cared. Yeah. And then had an uproar there if Kurt Angle, if we weren't trying to sign Kurt Angle to a deal. He just walked out because he found it offensive. So, and he, he still doesn't know to this day that I was involved in that. So I'm not going to clue him in on it. <laughs> he has no clue. Well, no, that's funny. I, I looked completely different than back then. So, but I mean, do you because you do an internet broadcast and and you were part of that? I mean, you were you were involved heavily in what was going on uh, with internet broadcasting. Could there be a revival of that, or do you think that society is totally different? I always, whenever somebody asks me about you know uh, the shock jock stuff, because we have a couple shows that do that kind of humor and that kind of programming. And I always describe it as it, it, the times have changed. The 90s were such an evolutionary time for that kind of programming. Uh, you know, and I always say Howard Stern, uh, pro wrestling, and, you know, even like Baywatch and all that, they kind of fit into this one category. If It was the first time you ever saw something like that. And that's why it was so successful. But on the internet, it's a totally different generation in time where you could Google any insane word combination and you'll find it. It exists somewhere. Yeah. I think right now we're, we're at an interesting time, and I don't even mean that in a good way. Because, I, I mean, if you watch VH1 at any point during the day, uh, that's where TV is going. The reality TV that is more scripted than any sitcom out there, and it's not even entertaining in my opinion. Uh, I think if uh, Howard Stern, Pro Wrestling, and even some other shows have inertia, that's that's why they're still kind of drawing the same crowd because people people know it. It's a brand they're familiar with, and they're always going to stick with that probably till the very end. Uh, but new shows, I, if you notice that reality TV, and you you do it with Big Brother. I'm not a reality TV show fan, uh, but I, I I just I can see so many people just getting involved in these reality shows and getting involved with these characters, but not paying attention to their own life. Yeah, I, and I I accuse Calm of that every time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a fascinating time, um, but when you when you're broadcasting and, and you're doing, you know, you're putting the shows together. What's the process like for you? Do you do you sit there and do you do notes? I, I'm always curious on on what other people do because we do, you know, we do show notes, and depending on the show, I'm either writing it or we have someone doing it for me. 
Uh, how do you do it? How do you break down and, and how do you determine what you're going to talk about? It's very organic. Uh, the stuff with me and Calm, that's that's what I was saying before. The, the chemistry, it takes a while and it might take a, a many people before you find that co-host or that person you do the show with that it just clicks. And that's that's what it is with me and Calm. And we talk about tech all day. So it's kind of like we're creating the show notes in our head anyways. We talk about it. And, you know, just like the mountain lion thing, I, we're sitting there and he's like, just, just install it, just install it, just install it. And I'm like, no, I, the, my Drobo FS might not work, this, that. I go, convince me to, to install this. Convince me it's a good upgrade. Okay, let's do a show. And that's, that's where we started it. We did bring up the, the website and we looked through all the features and stuff, but didn't really create a whole lot of show notes for that one. That's a good example of what we do. And you do the live stuff and you do the podcast stuff, but now you're also doing the SRX training, which is pre-recorded. It's it's totally different, different types of audio and video that are required for that. How what do you, how do you do that? Because um, I'm yeah. sure it's, it's it's night and day, right, when you compare the two. Not really, but I mean, my technology background and the the, the skills I have with video. Uh, and audio have have come in handy. I mean, that thing I completely locked out with that setup, Andrew. I I, I can't even believe. I still can't believe it worked. <laughs> it was, how do you, so? How do you do it? Okay, so what what I recommend if you have a Mac and Final Cut Pro 10, you're already halfway there. Now, what I do is um, I bought. I, I hated the fact with audio, especially my voice. There's nothing that that's my biggest pet peeve than when somebody has great video, yet they're using the stereo, the microphone on the camera. And they, it just the audio sounds terrible on review videos on other things. I'm sure you, I'm guilty of doing it for a long time. I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Sure. Uh, but with the workout videos, it's hard to walk around with a wired lav mic or have a boom mic over you when you're all over, you know, a pretty big area trying to get it to work. So I was saying, man, I don't know what to do. Uh, so I went to Sam Ash. I looked around for those wireless headset mics, like the really thin countryman one, the really fancy one. There you go. Oh, man, I'm struggling right there. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, I was looking at a bunch of them, and I was I was actually with my girlfriend, and I said, oh, I like this this Shure one. Look at how thin it is, and it's, it's I know it's 150 more, and she's like, you should go with that Samsung one, the Samsung Airline 77, which turned me on when she said the, the model number. I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, she, she goes, that's durable. She goes, that looks like what the, the aerobic instructors use and everything. And it's 100 bucks less. It was 350 So the uh, the Sam Ash guy said the same thing. He goes, that's what are you trying to do? So this was my setup that I had in my mind. And this is how it worked. Uh, you can set up endless amounts of cameras. I have two right now. I could set up my iPhone 4S. I could set up my iPad. I could set up any other uh, even the, I have a, a LX5, you know, a, a DSLR, a little DSLR type camera that shoots 720p video. You can set up endless kind of camera shots. And then what you do is you take something like an H4N, which accepts XLR. Yeah. And plug the wireless transmitter box into the H4N, set it up, make sure your, your audio levels are good. Put on the uh, wireless headset mic, which doesn't have, the one I have doesn't have one of those uh, belt clip packs. The pack is actually on the back of the headset, which is very handy because it, it just takes one more thing out of your way when you're doing workouts. Now I can walk around up to 100 feet to any of the one, two, three, four, five camera angles that I want to demonstrate an exercise on. And my audio is the same because when I go into Final Cut Pro 10, I take all those clips and I take that one audio source where it's recording on the H4N SD card and I sync everything up in a multicam clip. And as I'm playing the video, I cut to one camera, cut to another, cut to It's so cool how Final Cut Pro 10 how, does. How long does it take you to edit it? I, that, that, I, with, the, with the Retina, no time at all. Really? The Retina, right, the Red, this is the fastest Mac I've ever used. And when I... um. When I export, say, a 30-minute, that 30-minute video with with cuts, transitions, lower thirds, the watermark in the corner, uh, the 30-minute video, I think, took 12 minutes for 720p. But the chopping up, I, I'm talking the physical editing, you know, oh. where you're cutting portions out and you're putting it together. Uh, how, how long does that take you? I, when I'm doing an exercise because I'm familiar with the workout, Say that exercise you showed right there. If I didn't know a camera angle, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change that camera angle. We'd go to the next exercise, and I'd say, "Okay, I want to switch cameras here." I wouldn't play the thirty-minute video all the way through because I have bullet points of where I want. Just like when you do your your show, you have a thing in your mind like 
when I'm doing this, like Michael's talking about SRX training, I'm going to cut to the YouTube video. You already have it mapped out in your mind, like, like a blueprint of how the video is going to go. Uh, so it's not that hard. It takes a little practice. But the editing, it's the fun part, you know, because I can switch cameras and if I have an extra camera angle, like I want to put one up that looks like a surveillance type thing and make it black and white and a little staticky. Oh, that's very cool. And, you know, the right. stuff like that where you can get creative. So um, Joe DeMax actually said in the chat room, it might be a little side talk about Final Cut Pro 10 versus Final Cut 7. I don't know if you've used... I know he's used both. He's an he's an expert. I am I'm the worst person uh, when it comes to editing because I don't have the patience for it. So we have someone that does it uh, for us, but I'm I'm awful at it too. But uh, that is, that is interesting. How has it been for you? Uh, is there which one do you do you like better? You're not a big shot. I'm not a big shot like you. <laughs> no, I just have someone that that that's dumb enough to work for me. <laughs> I'm out of my mind. Well, I'm a guy, I'm a guy that even when I was wrestling, you know, and a, a lot of stuff in T, a lot of times in TNA, I would go into the truck because they would let us go into the truck and I would see how the editing worked. I just like creating uh, different things, different looks. Now, now actually, you know, filming a documentary, say, or doing something that involved in editing it, you know, like 10 or 15 hours of stuff into like a 30 minute or 60 minute show or whatever you want to make. I've never taken on that kind of task, but the general editing and cutaways and, you know, multi-cam edits and stuff like that. I, I, I enjoy doing that. I think it's cool. I really do. I'm a fan of it. I don't, I haven't done it for a living. If you're doing anything 40, 68 hours a week, I'm sure you eventually get tired of it. Sure. But uh, I have yet to get tired of it. Especially, like I said, this, I go back to it. This, this, this new MacBook Pro is so fast, you know, because usually when you export HD, it's uh, without the Turbo 264 or anything else to help you encode. It's a one-to-one, -one, meaning it'll take 30 minutes for a 30-minute video clip, or a one-to-two, meaning it'll take up to 60 minutes for a 30-minute clip when you're trying to do HD with all the transitions and stuff like that. The fact that this can do it in less time than the actual video that I have edited is a is a pretty monumental, you know, accomplishment. Do you, how do you edit the podcast? Do you use the same techniques for that or do you do a different, uh, different method? When we do Wirecast, it basically, we record live, uh, we stream it and we record live. So basically as it's, as, as it's streaming, we're recording it, uh, See, I haven't even gotten down all the, they just updated all the different encoding presets and stuff like that. I know you probably know more about it than I do, uh, but we, I think we go 854 by like 48p or something like that. Okay. You know, we do some not too. We don't need you know high def or anything to go up on YouTube on that. We just so, we just switched over to high def, and the debate's been uh, with our editor uh, John. The debate is: are we are we gaining anything from going HD, or are we? Or is it is it making no difference? Because technically, yeah, the 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 size of the canvas is 720p, 1280 by 720, but the bit rate that we're sending is still you know one megabit per second, and theoretically they say. Uh, you won't see a big difference unless you send about three megabits a second, and most people cannot view that. So, yeah, it, is it a pro? I mean, it, do you do you gain anything from sending high def video? Once again, we're going into the the Leo Laporte uh, comparison territory. I think when people start to do that, and and that's something I'll go back to people that want to start a podcast, people that want. And Mike Phillips is in the chat room. He says it all the time. Besides, audio is not important, which is sarcasm. <laughs> it's very important. Uh, you you have to have the content. We could have absolutely crappy 360p video and just just have a split screen for an entire hour. But if what we are talking about is interesting to a lot of people and we're interested and passionate about it, it doesn't matter. Do you feel that sometimes, uh, especially, you know, we're all guilty of this, that we concentrate so much on the technology that we kind of the content becomes secondary? Or do you think that has helped many people that have started in this in this industry, you know, of internet broadcasting, because we're not seasoned broadcasters, if we put the attention on the technology that we're using, it'll take away from the lack of content and the lack of experience in front of a microphone. Well, that shows through either way, and uh, you can't put lipstick on a pig. You could. I mean, I've seen people try to do it. You could, and they'll say, wow, look at that pig with lipstick, and then they'll realize it's a pig. Yeah, the, the novelty wears off. I mean, somebody could say, man, this is such a great... I, we, we have seen really well produced uh, broadcasts that have been awful. I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it. You hold your attention for about five minutes because you want to see how they do it. 
but the general consumer or the general uh, audience member is going to look at it for about five seconds and go, what the hell is this? Oh, switching over the big brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And by the way, big brother on CBS, one of the worst uh, qualities to any broadcast I've seen on network television in a long time. No HD cameras. They're using the same cameras they've been using for the last 12 years. Oh yeah, Colm talked about that. That that that's a that's one thing I found interesting about that. He tweets about how it's still an SD, and I don't think, I mean, if you're an HD and Big Brother's not, then I'd argue that you're a, a bigger show than Big Brother. <laughs> I wish, <laughs> I wish. Yeah, I can start telling that. I can start saying that to people. Oh yeah, the show's not an HD. I'm in uh, I'm in better shape than him. Um, how do you do the audio? Now, the audio, when you put it out, you do 128, do you do 64? 60. How do you, 64. And, and I, I, my, my stuff is very, my stuff is very, I've seen a lot of workflows. And for some reason, for me and Colm, when we're doing, uh, well, when we do the, um, when we do the Wirecast stuff, basically, I'll just bring the Wirecast video that we recorded to the desktop into GarageBand, delete the video. And pretty much, you know, take out take all the effects off and then export it as a 64K MP3 because uh, Libsyn, if you want to embed the player or if you want a podcast player on your site, you have to go MP3. I haven't seen one yet. And maybe you or Mike know if there's one that supports AAC because I, I'd love to save some storage space with that. Yeah, I don't know if any of them do that at this point. It's all MP3, um, right? It's all MP3, yeah. I, I mean, I could be wrong. And, and of course, you know, we're all learning as we go along and maybe it might be out. Uh, do you do mono or stereo for six, uh, for 64? I, I saw the question from Mike. I'm trying to remember. I think it's mono. You do mono. Okay, I think it's mono. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. We've had that debate a couple times on the show. If, uh, if, it's, if you should go to stereo or you could stay with mono. And I think depending on the person... Uh, and depending on what you're playing, uh, either or could work. If you have a lot of sound bits and you have audio playing and you're playing YouTube videos, uh, stereo is not a bad idea. But if you're doing exclusively talk, uh, you could stay with mono. Yeah, yeah, I do. And Mike, Mike's clarifying it. Yeah, when we're just doing for the podcast, the audio stuff, we don't upload video to Libsyn because that, that would get very expensive. Plus, it's on YouTube anyway. So why, you know, why not put it up there for free? Uh, yeah, but we do strictly audio for the podcast and put up some bonus content too uh, in the app, the iOS app, which we were going to talk about. And uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. The, the Macs are very, and you know, this is going to cause a whole nother debate. Macs are just so simple. I used to work in corporate America. I used to do Windows NT migration, junior level network administration, used to do uh, y to the, that whole Y2K mess paid me a lot of money i like that <laughs> so you were doing this while you were still wrestling i did this after i broke my neck and had my surgery I had fusion uh done and uh i did that from uh early 98 until when i got signed and after i got signed in with wwe in 99 and I actually got in trouble because i was still taking day jobs because back then you could make 10 15 20 bucks an hour just unbox pcs and put microsoft office and configure them i mean you could, it was the golden i mean i was the golden age for that kind of yeah. stuff i was doing it while i was on tv and i got in trouble and told to stop doing work when i'm not wrestling oh that's fascinating yeah huh um uh, so I want to talk about the app and I want to talk about different methods that you use to distribute your content. What has been the, the main place? Is it YouTube? Is it the website? Is it the app? It, um, the app, the app takes the feed from Libsyn. So I, what I use for podcasting and this, this can be something, uh, if you want to talk going from the beginning all the way up to where I'm at now, the very beginning, I obviously picked a, a free service like Podbean. You know, you, you can go with a free service, and I suggest anybody that starts out podcasting do that. So you don't want to invest any money you don't need to invest in the very beginning. You want to make sure you like what you do, and then you grow to love it. Libsyn's great because with their $20 plan and above, you get a free app. So it takes the feed from the podcast or any other bonus content you add on or any kind of wallpapers or pictures that you want to give people that buy the app. Uh, it gives it gives it all there one thing, and now they have brand new HTML5 uh, stuff and uh, everything else that you can do for for twenty bucks a month. It's not bad. It gives you four hundred megs of storage, unmetered bandwidth. So I think it's a really good deal. In each month, yeah, I mean that's not a bad deal, and I think that's great for uh, for many people. Um, I think it, it, it you necessarily do well with that if you have one show or two shows. When you're doing you know fifteen of them, that could get really pricey. 
Yeah, and the thing with that is you can create a new show underneath your account, and you can have all those shows under one account. It, it's pretty seamless. Uh, you have stats for each show, each download, uh, how many are streamed. Uh, the, the plans go up to, I, I used to have, uh, I think, the, the $40 plan for 750 mags, and then you have a 75 or 80 buck plan, and then you can go higher than that. I just like the unmeter bandwidth because you, you hope to be successful. You hope to have the problem that, oh, I need extra bandwidth on my site and stuff like that. This kind of takes the guesswork on, on your end out of that. And plus, you don't have to build an app. You can have a free yeah. iOS app with that. That's, yeah. that's a which, try which, to and that and that that's a huge step in the in the right direction. I think a lot of us need the app, but most most people don't have an app. Uh, have you seen the traffic come from the app? Do you see people downloading the app? How has that been for you? No, because the app cost a dollar ninety nine, and I think uh, quite frankly that's overpriced. But Libsyn needs to make their money. They're doing all the work for me, you know, and I get fifty percent of whatever after you know whatever after they do. I would love it to be a ninety nine cent or a free app. Uh, but that's Lipson's decision, not mine. Oh, okay. Nobody really go. Nobody really. It's weird. You know, you're talking about this is something that, that I don't know when it was going to come up, but I'll bring it up. It's it's a weird algorithm uh, metric, especially with YouTube. You know, and, and even iTunes. When you're talking about subscribers, to how people are going to view your stuff, I still haven't figured it out. As a matter of fact, I think I've gotten worse at it since they've changed it around. It seems like YouTube and iTunes are such a moving target to try to get your show seen and heard. Uh, and you're talking naturally within its within its own traffic. So if I were to put in uh, Michael Mana, for example, uh, would it come up as the first video? Let's or if it. I were to put in T4 show, and let me do that actually. Uh, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, I don't get it. First time I've ever Google. Oh, Stevie Richards, Wikipedia. Uh, very angry Steve Richards picture. So you get uh, actually the first video that pops up for uh, Michael Manna on YouTube is the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Which is weird because it doesn't have a lot of views. I don't I don't understand that. Or this guy who's the lawyer. The lawyer. Things. Yeah. You get the lawyer a lot from New Jersey. I like to have his problems. <laughs> uh, uh, the perfect game thing comes up on the second page, which I'm amazed because perfect game video, which I'll, I'm just going to go here real quick while we're doing this, has 117,000 views for the perfect game in MLB 2K11. I think that's the highest amount of views I've ever had. So you, that, that's fascinating. And, and, and uh, Combs told me that, that you played the perfect game a week the before show. the contest started. Actually, about a month. A uh, month before. March 8th, March 8th is the day the game, the game came out, and that's when they used to have uh, the perfect game contest to compete with MLB The Show for PS3. Uh, but this year for some or that year for some reason, it was April 1st, the start of the uh, MLB season. I wasn't looking. You see, I see. I saw that as a great opportunity to do some social media, to work with uh, 2K Sports and do some great stuff. And they didn't. Uh, and I was only maybe 45 minutes from spring training at the time. I lived in Tampa and they didn't they didn't try to capitalize on that. I thought it would have been a really cool thing for us to do together. And they kind of hid their head in the sand and didn't even say anything. Um, did you, did you do like, did it bring an audience to T4 show? Did it help with that? It did. It did. But you know, you know how the internet is, you know, how bloggers are and people, especially wrestling fans, they, they made it look like I was trying to reach out and say, Oh, I want the million dollars. And it would have been nice to have, it would have been great to have, I would have better studio than this right now. But uh, it, uh, it was more just, you know, I was answering questions and I kept repeating, I don't, I don't want the money. I just thought this would have been some kind of cool uh, uh, publicity thing for both of us to do. And I wanted to promote T4 show. It After about a month, it probably died off and went back to normal. Okay. So, has, uh, has Twitter and Facebook been a been an important thing for you? Uh, have Has the wrestling background helped with the show or are they totally separated? What, what's been, you know, the main uh, way people are finding out about it? Uh, at this point, I don't even think, honestly, anybody's finding out about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know about it. I think social media has really jumped the shark. It's been, it, it's gotten to a, to a, uh, such a point, Andrew, I don't, I don't know. If, here's the metric I look at, too. Joey Styles will tweet to WWE people. He has about two or 300,000 followers and also put it up on WWE's website. Uh, you know, hey, SRX Training has some workout videos. Check them out. Now, I think the highest I have is the opening video has given me like 1,100 views. My average views on that SRX Training is probably 50 to 100 views of free 30-minute workouts that you can, you know, pretty much 
use these to get in shape. They're free. You know, I normally cost money to have somebody train you. Uh, yet this guy with 203, two or 300,000 followers and millions of hits, unique hits a month on WWE.com. And I can't get 100 views on one video that he tweets out. Yeah, that's fascinating. Do you think there's something? I guess I'm a terrible person. <laughs> no, but where do, you, where do you think the disconnect is? Do you think it's, it's uh, the followers aren't really followers? Do you think it's that it's overhyped? And the reality is even if you have a million followers on Twitter, not all those people are actually sitting there and, and, and looking at everything you're doing. Yeah, I think the interaction. I think the interaction is 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 really subpar. I think also. I mean, I know the wrestling fans are not the target audience for fitness, but they kind of are for gaming and technology and stuff. And he's put the word out about that as well. Uh, I I don't know. That's what I said in the very beginning of this discussion about that. That the algorithm or the metric or whatever they use with YouTube iTunes, social media, or even just putting your site on Alexa rating is just kind of very vague, especially YouTube. YouTube is very vague. They have their, they have their favorites that they like the feature that they like that. I Justine's videos are awful. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. There's a lot of, it sucks. There's a lot of stuff out there that sucks. And if I could get a three minute video of my cat pissing on the lawn, I bet I would get more views than what we're doing right now. Yeah. And, and, and that also says something about people's attention span and, and what we're conditioned to watch on YouTube. You know, it, 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 I think a lot of times, and, and I was talking to somebody about this and they were saying the biggest mistake that we make as podcasters that was, is that we feel that we need to do a show for two hours. And by the way, I, I don't agree with this. I think there is a place for that. Uh, but he was saying how people don't have that attention span to sit there for two hours. So a lot of times people click on a video and they see it's a two and a half hour video and they don't watch it. The other thing that we could do is chop up certain segments, put that up as a three minute clip, and that might do a lot better. Uh, and I think that also helps. I mean, promotion in any way helps. But in, in reality, it comes down to word of mouth and, and the cross promotion that you do. And, you know, uh, you've been on the show a couple of times and... and uh, with the chat room is watching and somebody from the chat room will ask you to be on, you know, you've done Chase's show. I think that's the way to build this, this diehard audience that'll come back and you could grow from there. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to say one quick thing and then make another point about Chase. And she just said that the, the thing that really makes it from a completely positive perspective is when someone emails me, even though I have only 50 views on a particular workout video, somebody will email me and say, I followed every one of you and I've gotten like five or six emails, which is really humbling. And, 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 and you know, makes me a little, a little emotionally about it because it's really heavy when someone says to you, I've, I've followed every one of your videos that you put up since you were doing the T4 show fitness. Cause I have about 70 or 80 videos, I think up on T4 show videos on YouTube that have to do with fitness. I followed every single one of them and I lost 40, 50, 60 pounds over the past year. Because I just followed your videos. You can't stop doing it. Yeah. There's no way. Because I help one person. I help more than one person. But even if I just help that one person do something like that, make a life-changing, life-altering, uh, you know, uh, decision in the, you know, to using my workouts, that's that's really heavy, man, and cool. No, it goes, it goes a long way. I, Mike Phillips in the chat room said, uh, one thank you goes a long way. And you're absolutely right. The first, the, the, that, that, that recognition that you get from that one person really motivates you in, into constantly doing this and, and saying, you know what? I'm doing something good here. Yeah. And, and talking about good chase, chase's production is off the chart. And the geek gamer weekly show is amazing. And you know, the way he puts that together and it looks, I mean, it's much better than my show <laughs> and, and he gets like a third, if not less than the views and the downloads that I get too. I, I mean, that's, that's what really, confuses me the show is even better than mine and gets even less views than mine i think it comes down to also where people are viewing it um uh, you know we we do a lot of our live stuff uh depending on the show you know our podcasts do well but certain shows that you would imagine would do better live don't do as well as, as you kind of would guess that they would i, I think there, there's a lot of magic that gets involved in this and by magic i mean uh right time right people right day you know is it the summer or people out? i think a lot of that affects how the viewership uh is is going and the trend that it's going but as long as you see some sort of growth you know that you're onto something if you start seeing it going backwards then you're obviously not doing right 
Yeah. I think, uh, too, and this might that sound, a little, I don't know how this is going to sound, saying that I would I would really concentrate on building those relationships with the company because you know, with the companies like, you know, the cell phone carriers or these these accessory makers, like I got this thing here, the smart focus for uh, the iPhone 4S. And, you know, you reach out to these people and you show a good body of work and you show positive uh, interaction and your show isn't just there to bitch about technology too. be 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 mindful of that. If you just get on there and keep saying this sucks, that sucks, everything, people aren't going to give you the opportunity to review yeah. their products either. Uh, I'm not saying lie. I'm just saying be be mindful. There's a good good and bad things about everything in technology, but I would I would work for people in their first year doing it. I would get stuff, review what you have on hand, do those updates, do as many videos as you can, and then reach out to these companies and try to build those relationships. If you build relationships with them and you bring them on the show, which I do too sometimes, and bring people on the show and interview them about their product then people will get a little more interested because now the companies are kind of, you know, giving you their blessing that, Hey, this guy's cool. You can go over there and check out the interview or go over there and check out his product. Yeah, no, the, absolutely. The relationship that you build with, uh, some of these companies really goes a long way. Uh, you know, we get asked this question all the time. How do I get an advertiser? Uh, I've sent out a bunch of emails and nobody's responded to me. What am I doing wrong? And it really comes down to the relationship you build with the company. You know, we have Hover as an advertiser for the GFK network, and it's beyond just providing a show. It's beyond that. I think it really comes down to the relationship that you build with the specific person from the company. Because guess what? If they like you, they're going to keep giving you money. They're going to yeah. they're going to consider you over obviously if it's working, but they're going to consider you over someone that they don't really know. So I, it does come down to the relationship that you build with the companies and you really should not be a jerk when you when you're doing these reviews. You know, we do AT&T phones. Uh, they send us phones all the time. And there's been times that I haven't liked the product and I've been vocal about it, but I haven't said it sucks. And that's it. I've explained that the aspects of the product that I really don't like. And I think yeah. that's something that we a lot of people need to learn. It, it, the internet is really rough at times, and we we criticize things before we consider how we should say it. You know, we're used to saying, "Oh, that sucks," and just walking away from it, not explaining. We need a lot of people just need to to have fun with this. That's the number one thing. You need to. You know, I always say, people go, "Yeah, you set this stuff up, and you do all this stuff, and it, it seems like a pain in the ass, and everything." Or, or you you know you're you're putting up content, but you're only getting 300 views. I get a lot of comments about that. You put all this money into production and do all this stuff, which isn't exactly true. But I say to them that I'm doing the same stuff I do all day. I play with iPhone apps. I play with uh, you know the Retina Display MacBook Pro. I'm going to play with this accessory. I got the Samsung Galaxy S3 from Sprint back there. I play with this stuff all day and test it out and see how it works within my life. And then all I do is grab a camera or two and hit record. I work out every day. So I hit a couple cameras, three cameras, put on a headset mic, hit record, start working out. It's not inconvenient at all. It's what I do all day anyway. And now I'm making content out of it. Where do you, where would you like the CT4 show go? I mean, the next five years, let's say you do this, where, where what would be your end goal? Where do you want to go with internet broadcasting? My dream is that I obviously do something like T4 show. If it doesn't have this incarnation, uh, full time and try to make a living at it. Uh, that would be a dream. That would be great. It'd be great to do it with Calm. I want, I wouldn't want to change that no matter where I go with uh, T4 show or as a show, I wouldn't want uh, to, to, I would want to take him with me because he, like I said, he brings a lot of energy and I, I work better with him. Uh, I would like to be doing little tech segments and, and morning shows and stuff like that. I've always been trying to, to, you know, politic to do that you down here in Florida, anywhere. I've been trying to do that, and uh, I've never had an agent, even throughout 20 years of wrestling. I never, I always did my own business. I don't know if that was a positive or negative thing, but uh, you know, I've always tried to to reach out to people like these morning shows and these other places, and try to to get myself on there, not only for the tech stuff but the fitness stuff. So that would be another goal, and um, I mean, anything else that comes my way, as long as I keep doing it. And people, as somebody, and I get emails like that once in a while, I, I'm never going to stop doing stuff like this. And where do you see the evolution of internet broadcast that headed? Do you think the bubble, I mean, there was a bubble that, that burst a couple of years ago, but are we, are we, in, in, are we going to have another bubble burst? Are we going to see a, a boom in this? Where do you, where do you see this headed? 
I'm going to answer uh, one of your viewers' questions. He said, Michael Matt of fitness, fitness DVDs. I do plan on bringing an SRX training out, hopefully, just as digital downloads. It's much easier. You can get it instantly. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do DVDs, uh, but when I get the system together, that will be something I'll look at and, and distributing it like we do our shows and stuff, trying to do it in a technological manner. Uh, but as far as internet broadcasting, I don't think it's going to, I don't think there's a bubble that's going to burst. Uh, unless they, unless they do some really shady stuff with the internet in general, unless they do something like the government, uh, what were they talking about? Having licensing fees or something like that? I think I heard that on Leo's show once where it would essentially shut down a lot of these internet broadcasts like ours. We wouldn't be able to afford to, to, to pay the government to be able to do our shows. I don't know the exact law that they were talking about, but I heard something like that and it kind of scared me. Well, what's scary is that the, the more available and accessible this becomes, uh, the more of a chance that we risk that it gets regulated in some way. You know, we're talking about getting in the car and with Stitcher Radio and all these other services, but the reality is it could be possible that over the next 10 years, this will be as regulated as, as terrestrial radio because it's over the air and most people are going to have internet. So how do you control it? I mean, it, it's always a possibility. I mean, we had that fear with satellite radio, but satellite radio was such a niche thing where it, it would be nearly impossible to do that. Uh, but it, it, it's something that's fascinating to me because ter terrestrial radio is really going away. And what's going to take its place? Obviously, it's the internet. Yeah. I, I think I think one of the things that are still missing with this is that we need to to have a better uh, better way to get the information to someone that really knows nothing about technology. And I think in this point in this pos in this time that we're in, you still have to know how to find something. I have to know to look for T4 show. I can't just turn on a show uh, a channel in my car and there's T4 show on its own. I, I think that's what needs to change. I don't know if you agree or not. Yeah, I don't. I want you to start talking. You use words like control, yeah. uh, government in the same sense. It, it sort of makes my heart skip a beat in a bad way. <laughs> I, I don't think this needs to be regulated. Why can't it, it just go on the way it goes on and let it grow? Why does everything have to be control regulated? All it is right down to the to what it is, is they're just trying to figure out a way to make money for themselves. They're just trying to figure a way to tax us. You know, there could be, uh, you know, a uh, podcasting tax coming out or a podcasting license or this or that or the yeah. other thing. It's going to turn a lot of people away uh, from doing it. Sure. I, I can't even imagine because I have common sense. I can't even imagine what they could do <laughs> to make it, you know, to shut down the internet. or do They have the internet switch already. So, I mean, they have the potential... Uh, to to control it any way they choose to, they're just going to keep pushing a little bit. This is this is a whole. I mean, if you have a political show, I can be on there and talk about that. <laughs> yeah, trust me, we we've gone into this, and it's scary how it could, it could well, potentially happen. Well, the Facebook thing, the, the, this could get out of control. This conversation, but the Facebook thing is a prime example. Facebook will throw a little something in there to to kind of violate your privacy, and see if anybody notices. And then somebody might notice, but then after a while, people just don't have the wherewithal to kind of keep up and keep the government or keep someone like face or, or do anything with these entities to keep them in check. They just kind of go along. All right, I'm going to go along with the timeline. I'm going to go along with this. I might as well. What can you do? Right. I mean, the reality is this, is, this could potentially be two separate things. You know, all these issues that we're facing with possible regulation when it comes to the Internet and we had the SOPA Act, uh, you know, that was a whole big deal a couple months ago either we're going to look back and be like i can't believe they tried to do this or we're going to look back and say wow do you remember when you could do this on the internet when it wasn't this regulated uh I, it's a scary time to think that it could go either way uh but, but it's in its infancy i mean that's the thing the internet is is only you know in in its current way uh i would say 15 years i mean you know the internet as we know it is going to evolve and change but is it going to be better or worse we don't know. We spent about 90% of the time trying to encourage people to do internet broadcasts. Now we're that's a waste of our time. I know. I know. Uh, but we should wrap it up. It is, uh, we're past the hour. Once again, Michael, uh, you can check out his show, t4show.com. Uh, it's a great uh, tech podcast. They do tech, uh, gaming, uh, pretty much anything that comes to your mind, uh, you guys talk about. It. It's on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. East live. You can check it out at t4show.com. 
You can also download it uh, wherever podcasts are available, uh, iTunes, uh, your website, wherever it is. Also, uh, your your workout, SRX Training. Uh, where can people get more information on that? They can follow me on Twitter at SRX Training. Also, they can like our Facebook page, and hopefully uh, when they see the show, you will have as many likes as you. You have 3,700. I only have about 400. Right I don't now. even know where they came from. Oh, well, <laughs> wherever they came from, send them my way. But I'll yeah. send them your way. We posted SRX training was a way to separate it from T4 show and just keep that technology based in this fitness. And also I put up wrestling videos and stuff you've never seen on TV. A lot of house shows or some independent stuff. So some interesting, uh, you know, exclusive stuff that only I have. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Michael, thanks again for coming on uh, the IIB spotlight. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers learned a lot uh, from this interview. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, once again, you can go to ibroadcastnetwork.org. If you miss any portion of the show, you can sign up for the IAIB. That's the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Uh, we have a great forum there uh, for anybody that wants to get started with internet broadcasting or if you are an internet broadcaster wanting to spread the wealth of information. Uh, also, uh, if you miss any portion of this, you can go to gfknetwork.com and watch it there. Until next time, guys. See you later. See you later.